Welcome to Sunday Night Live. Tonight, it's not with Father Benedict Rochelle. It's with Father Andrew Apostoli. Father could not be here tonight, so he asked if I would cover his program tonight. Actually, I was supposed to cover his program about two weeks ago, but technical difficulties made it impossible to air that particular uh, program. So I'm happy to be able to be here for Father so he could take a well-deserved rest. Please always, as I always appeal, please keep Father in your good prayers. You know, Father does the work of so many, many uh, people. When I first went to work with him back around 1985, uh, I thought he was doing the work of five people. He slowed down a little bit. He's only doing the work of three men a day. And, uh, and he, but he, I'm, I, I think of him in comparison to St. Paul, since we're here in the year of St. Paul, and St. Paul said he poured his life out like a libation, an offering. He kept nothing of himself for himself. And that's the way Father Benedict Groeschel is. I, I've known him very well as a close friend and as a, a confrere in the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. You know, he's got a mission. I remember Cardinal O'Connor saying this, that Father Benedict had a mission to the whole church and he certainly has um, upheld the teachings of the church with great, great um, clarity and strength. He has not been afraid to, you know, take the stands that are needed to proclaim truth. At the same time, he is uh, our spiritual leader in our community in the renewal, Franciscan friars and sisters of the renewal. We look to him as our, a kind of spiritual leader. And he's touched the lives of so many individual people. So always keep Father Benedict in your good prayers. I'm happy to be here tonight to be sharing this program with you. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we wanted to announce that um, uh, we're going to have a very special guest here tonight. Uh, he's a man who had a great conversion to Christ in his own life. And this conversion has marked his life in such a way that he's spending himself, like Father Benedict, helping others to turn to Christ. He told me as we were preparing for the program, he said that he's grateful to Jesus, giving him the grace, you know, of conversion. He came to know Jesus. He wants everyone to know Jesus. Both Father Benedict and I have known this man for about 12 years. He comes from London, England, and he is presently a member of St. Patrick's Community. It's a uh, private association of the faithful based in Ireland, and its focus is the work of evangelization. It has, uh, the, uh, the association has the approval of Bishop Colum Ryan, Riley and the Diocese of Arda and Clone McNoyes. I would like to welcome to the show tonight, John Pridmore. John, welcome. Thank you, Father Andrew. Great to be here. Oh, it's always great to be with you. And uh, maybe you could share with the, our viewing audience tonight, when was the last time we met? <laughs> well, we actually met on Life on the Rock, Father, that um, I was giving my testimony, and you came on to give us an update on how Father Benedict was, because it was just after his accident. And so that was the last time I saw you, but it's great to see you again. Isn't that amazing how EWTN seems to be bringing <laughs> it us brings together. brings us together, exactly. That's amazing. Um, well, John, it's so, certainly uh, you have a, a very, very interesting background, and I, uh, I'm sure you, you would want to share some of the highlights of your life's journey to Christ. Yeah, I was um, baptized a Catholic father, but I was never brought up in any religion. At the age of about 10, I came home a normal night, and my parents told me that I had to choose who I wanted to live with because they were getting divorced. And I expect that I loved my parents so much and I couldn't choose because the two people I loved the most had hurt me. So I think I made an unconscious decision inside that I wasn't their love again. Um, at the age of 13, I started stealing. <coughs> Um, I spec because I wanted someone to take notice of the pain that I was in. At 15, I was put in detention centre, which was like a youth prison, and I actually left home at 15. And my only qualification was stealing, so that's what I did. Um, at 19, I was in prison again. There was another change in me because I was in a lot of solitary confinement because I think I turned a lot of the abuse in my life into anger. I came out of there and I started um, getting involved with organised crime around the east end and west end of London. By the age of 27, 
I had everything that the world says makes you happy. I had the penthouse flat, the sports cars, more money than I could spend. But inside I was empty. I think Pope John Paul II said that the person who gives us the desire to search for him in our hearts is Jesus. And unless we have a personal encounter with Jesus, we're never fully satisfied or complete. And I hadn't had that personal encounter, so I expect I was looking for the false gods to fill that emptiness. So I was on crack cocaine, smoking dope like it was going out of fashion, drinking really heavy. I was involved in some awful crimes. I was involved in protection rackets, massive drug deals. You know, everything that sort of takes you away from everything that is good and goodness. I met a priest who told me in the midst of all this about a retreat that was happening. Well, I'll be honest with you, I thought a retreat was lying on the beach, nice chick, a spliff, just chilling for a couple of weeks, and I thought I could do the holiday, so I'd go on this retreat. Well, when I got there, it wasn't quite like I imagined. It must have been <laughs> some <laughs> surprise. It was, John, and that's then, for sure. <laughs> and there was about 250 young people. It was a Youth 2000 retreat. And at this retreat, some of these young people had a joy I'd never seen before. And some of them were coming up and hugging me. Well, I don't know if you know ex-gangsters, but we're not into this hugging business yet. Yeah? So that was the first thing I had to get over. But then there was a talk, and this talk was, Give me your wounded heart. And as I listen to this priest speaking about how every sin we commit is like a wound on our heart, I was looking at a crucifix. And for the first time in my life, I really understood why Jesus had died on that cross. Because the darkest, most terrible sins I'd ever committed, he gladly carried to that crucifixion in his heart. And I was filled with a real sorrow for my sins. But much more than this sorrow was this incredible joy because it was like Jesus saying to me, John, if you was the only person, I would die just for you. And I started crying and I cried probably for the first time since I was 10 because that part of my heart which I had closed off, it was like Jesus had suddenly opened it with his love. And he was saying, I will never let you down. I will, I've never forgotten you. I've always been there with you. I came out of that talk and I said a prayer to Our Lady. And I just said, what is it that your son wants me to do? And I just felt her whisper in my heart, go to confession. Now, I'd never been to confession in my life, and I think I had broken practically every commandment there was. But somehow, even though I was scared, Our Lady gave me the courage. And I went to confession, and I was there over an hour, and I left nothing out. And at the end of this confession, this priest put his hand on my head and absolved me from my sins. But it wasn't his hand, it was Christ's hand. And I knew in my heart that I'd been truly forgiven. Like, I, it was like that sin had killed me, but that confession had brought me back to life. It was like I wanted to, um, I just couldn't believe. Like, it was like I could, everything became alive to me again. And like, I know a lot of people, when they go to confession, they're almost ashamed of what the priest might think of them. Well, that priest, as I finished my confession, he was crying because he was Jesus to me, and he was just so happy to have me return to that grace and that sacrament. Isn't that what Jesus says too when he, in the gospel when he says, uh, John, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 good people who don't need to repent because it's like the lost sheep has come back, the prodigal exactly. son has come and, back. And I really felt that celebration, you know, you know when it says in the prodigal son, he celebrated, I really felt that celebration. I was just so filled with that grace and that freedom which I had never known before. It's like this massive weight being taken off my heart. Yeah, yes. And then there was a mass. Now I was never brought up as a Catholic and I remember there was one time when they brought Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament across the fields and everyone started kneeling down and saying this is our Lord and I actually thought it was the priest who was carrying Jesus who was our Lord and I thought he's too old he doesn't look like Jesus this is how far away from but anyway at this mass I said a simple prayer and I said if this is truly you Jesus then show me because I don't understand and as I received Jesus on that day just after being to confession the only way I can describe it is every good feeling I had in my life was magnified a billion times. And I knew that that was Jesus, body, blood, soul and divinity. Not because anyone had taught me, but I had personally asked Jesus and he had shown me. And I don't think it was any coincidence 
that I had to go to confession first to have my eyes open to the wonderful gift of Christ in the Eucharist. I think the two That's very right. much go together. That's right, John, because, you know, sin is the obstacle. You know, when you read the story in the Gospel about the, the Samaritan woman, you know, she wanted to receive the living water that Jesus wanted to give her, um, which was really the Holy Spirit. And Jesus knew uh, water can't flow when there's an obstacle, and the Holy Spirit can't come if there's an obstacle called sin. And so your confession took that away, and, and then you were ready to receive abundant graces of, uh, uh, of the Eucharist. Uh, John, I, I'm sure that our listening audience, viewing audience here, uh, must, some of the people must be wondering, I wonder, here's a young man that was really far from God, and look, he's turned his life around. In fact, John, now after your conversion, uh, the Lord seemed to open the door of evangelization for you, but how did you come from that retreat to working full-time in evangelization? I remember when I was at that retreat, a priest actually asked me to give my testimony, and, and I just, there was no way I was giving my testimony in public, so I left, and I wouldn't give my testimony, and I felt guilty about this, because I really felt probably God was asking me to give my testimony, and some months later in my own parish, I went to our parish priest who was Father Dennis Hall, great priest, and I said to him, look, Father, I'd really love to give my testimony. And he prayed about it, and he said, you give your testimony at the confirmation group. And I thought to myself, well, that's great. There'll only be about 20 or 30 young people. You know, it's nice and small. When I walked into the church, there was 380 people <laughs> because there was 160 confirmation young people that year, and all their family and friends were there. So I was very nervous. But... One lady at the end of my testimony came up and she was crying and she just said, you've really touched my heart. And that took away all the nerves, it took away everything. I just felt God's really spoke here. And that inspired me to carry on giving my testimony. And obviously coming from my lifestyle, it wasn't an overnight sort of thing. But then I met one of the friars, it was Father Glenn Sudano. Oh, yes, my career. Yeah, and Father Glenn invited me to come to the Friars, and after spending a year in a retreat house in Scotland, Craig Lodge, I went to the Friars, and I got some very good spiritual direction there, Father, because you was my spiritual director, <laughs> if you right. remember. <laughs> yes. but, but I think the Friars for me was a great stepping stone in not just being healed, like even though I wasn't called to stay with the friars, I really felt I received so much healing and also so much grace on what it was to really evangelize and to really, you know, come back with that mission, the mission to really bring the love of Christ to as many young people as I could, you know, so that's really where yeah. the stepping stones brought me into that evangelization. Well, that was a, that was a great gift. You know, I kind of, I can't help but think of St. Paul's experience. You know, he said it himself, I'm not worthy to be an apostle. I persecuted the church of God. He was far from the Lord too. But, um, when he turned it around, just as you did in your conversion and as God did in your life for you, John, um, you know, the zeal was there. And I think absolutely. you told me before you were grateful. Yeah, absolutely. Like, it's such a privilege, Father. I don't deserve the privilege to be able to speak to young people and to not so young, young at heart, as you put it earlier. To, I just don't deserve it. It's such a grace for me. And you know that the scripture where it says, he who is forgiven much will love much. And it's like, I just take it as my absolute gift that I can do this. And I absolutely love it. There's no greater gift. That's an important point. We're coming up to one of our, our first break in a, a, few, a minute or so. But I think for those who are listening, you know, when you hear John, you know, express the kind of life that he was living, um, God's grace drawing him back, you know, it, we're never too far from God. God's mercy is greater than any wrong we could ever do. And, you know, as he said, being grateful to, to the Lord for intervening in our life, for bringing us back, because we don't know how bad off we are when we're caught in sin, you know, and we don't know. You, when, when there's darkness, when you're surrounded by darkness, you can't see the light. But once you begin to see that light, you realize the darkness you've come out of, Absolutely. and you feel grateful to the Lord for what he's done for you. Well, we're going to be taking a, a break in uh, just a few moments, John. When we come back, we're going to be uh, talking about your community that you are 
actually the founder of. So we'll be right back. Don't go away. We'll be right back here on EWTN. <laughs>